handle the truth. Hi, and welcome back to the Truth Podcast. Episode four, sponsored by Gatorade Santiago and La Liga Works, is a two-part episode which we'll dub Lost Careers. I'm Mikey Domagala, and alongside my co-host, Jermaine Barnes, we'll talk about NBA players whose careers were curbed by addiction. And from our two guests, they'll describe their stories and mistakes they made so listeners and other players can avoid doing the same. Now, JB, you know, you've been around basketball and you've been watching for over 30 years. You've seen many players famously pass through the league quickly due to addiction and, you know, drugs, alcohol. Drop some of those players who were what ifs, who were so good on the court, but off the court, they were just curbed by those demons. I mean, shoot, man, first and foremost, I mean, I think it's all due respect coming from us, you know, with the True Podcast. But um, it's not a subject of us per se pointing fingers or, or ridiculing them. It's more so to educate our next generation. Um, we all know about the great Lynn Bias, who was neck and neck with Michael Jordan in the NCAA, who lost his life draft night due to substance abuse. Um, we know about Reggie Lewis, who was a two-time All-Star that played with the great Larry Bird. You know, uh, a lot of stories didn't come out about that, but it was also said it was substance abuse. Uh, Eddie Griffin, uh, the NCAA standout that played for the Timberwolves, um, committed suicide on drug abuse. Uh, the list goes on, on and on, man. And, um, it's really unfortunate that these things go on in the league, but I think it's super important that we touch on this because it's such a elephant in the room, so to speak, with the league. I think the NBA did a fantastic job in the 80s cleaning up the drugs, and now we're in a new millennium, but now, you know, the culture is kind of sinking back slowly. So, um, you know, I, I feel like it's very important that we do this show, and I think it's awesome that we have two former NBA guests that are here to share their stories and also help this next generation not to make the mistakes they made. It's going to be a very exciting show, and we're going to really get the truth from these guys about their careers, what they went through. JB, two other names that come to me, you know, those guys you mentioned were, you know, 80s, 90s, early 2000s. More recently, I'm thinking OJ Mayo, who had his problems, you know, off the court, and the NBA really blackballed him. I mean, he hasn't been back in the league since. And then just about a year, two years ago, Tyreek Evans, who was one of, you know, a really good player coming up when he was a rookie. Uh, he won rookie of the year, actually. And, yeah. you know, then he had his demons off the court and he was banned from the NBA for a year. And him, too. He hasn't played since. Oh, O.J. Mayo. Um, I was a big fan. Uh, I love O.J. I actually speak to O.J. now. He's currently playing in Taiwan and China. He's doing fantastic. He's bounced back. Uh, I don't know what Tyreek's doing, but it is very unfortunate what's going on because Tyreek was actually averaging 19 points a game for uh, the Pacers and Memphis. So, I mean, his career was still flourishing. It's unfortunate. I would like to see a bounce back kind of like what the Birdman did. He yeah. got put out for two years for substance abuse and he came back and won the title. I'm actually very thankful that the NBA gives these guys a second chance. One guy that we didn't mention is Richard Dumas who played alongside Charles Barkley in the finals uh, against the Bulls and Michael Jordan. And this guy was amazing, but he couldn't put down the bottle. And that's not me speaking. This is me following his journey. And he said it himself. He showed up the games drunk, so he couldn't beat the demon. So, you know, it's really unfortunate because I would have loved to see a 10-year career out of Richard Dumas and guys like that. It's just these guys not living up to the full potential when – they have, they have all the money. They have the spotlight in the NBA. They're really flourishing. But, man, you know, I'll call them the demons again. Those off-the-court demons just, just get to them. And, you know, that's tough. But before we bring on our guest, who will be announced in a, in a little bit, JB, we haven't spoken in a while, my man. You know, yeah. since then, James Harden and Blake Griffin, who would have thought, I mean, Blake Griffin would be a Brooklyn Net. All that stuff happening over the last month. What do you think of this new Nets team? KD, Kyrie, Harden, Blake Griffin, DeAndre Jordan, Spencer Dinwiddie, the list goes on and on. Man, you know what? I was flying back to Europe when this news broke. You know, uh, personally, I love what the Nets are doing. And I don't want to be the, the guy that, that's negative about the Nets situation, but I didn't think Blake Griffin was the answer. I think uh, JaVale McGee, drummings you need a rim protector letting go of allen was the biggest mistake the nets made uh kd i feel is the best player in the world 
Kyrie Irving and James Harden are playing phenomenal. I think James Harden is the MVP of the league. It's my personal opinion. I mean, he's doing a great job playing just pure point guard. But those three are special. Blake Griffin, I think, suited a Miami Heat team that needed more scoring. Blake is not a rebounder. He's not a shot blocker. I mean, he wants to dribble and shoot threes. He doesn't have the explosiveness anymore. And that's not a knock. I know Blake personally, but I'm just saying what it is. I, I don't think it was a good move. I hope it works out for him because he's a good guy. But I think what the Lakers did last year is what the Nets need, the Dwight Howard and JaVale McGee. This, I, I don't know. You want to put KD back where he's naturally comfortable and Blake and him kind of play the same position. And Blake's trying to do that, whatever that is, was 12 points, five rebounds. That's not what they need. I mean, they already have that. They need protection. Yeah, well said, and we'll see what else the Brooklyn Nets do over the next two weeks, just about 12 days away from the NBA trade deadline, so that'll be exciting to see. You know, JB, we just came off the NBA All-Star break. Uh, a little interesting, not having any fans, really. Uh, skills competition winner was Sabonis. Three-point shootout winner was Steph Curry. Uh, Anthony Simons was the dunk contest winner. And All-Star MVP went to your guy. I know you love Giannis. Went to Giannis. He went 16 for yeah. 16 from the floor. So tell me what you thought about uh, all-star festivities this year. I think the all-star game stinks. You know, uh, they don't play hard. I mean, they just don't. And it's, I mean, it's a disgrace. I grew up in the era where the all-star games meant something because those guys were getting paid to play in those all-star games. Now with the guaranteed contracts, they have no incentive to compete anymore. They already have everything. So they're just, oh, I'm just here. So I won't get fined. Marshawn Lynch, you know, they're just, they're just there. I love Giannis, but I mean, who, who cares? You want an all-star MVP. I mean, like you say, he's 12 for 12 or something like that. Cause you just stood around the rim and dunked. I mean, I don't know. I didn't like it. I, I thought it was pretty bad. I don't like the format of the NBA dunk contest, three participants and yeah. the scoring system. It's just, everything's watered down. You should keep it original. And it was, to the point, Michael Jordan, Dominique, and superstars, Kobe, Vince, all these guys were in the dunk contest. It meant something. They have devalued what it means to be in the dunk contest, to be an all-star. Like, all of these things, it's, it's unfortunate. I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but it's a bad product to watch right now. Yeah, you know, dunk contest, three participants back in the 80s and 90s, JP, they were up to as many as, like, 8 to 10. And like yeah. you said, all – like stars actually participating this year we had two rookies Obi Toppin and Cassius Stanley and uh second or third year guy in Anthony Simons so yeah man we got a different perspective and a different way of going through things in these all-star breaks but before we begin our interview you know I want to touch on the Western Conference because many would think the Lakers and the Clippers would be at the top but you know Lakers going through some injuries the Clippers just about there at the top of the West, we got the Utah Jazz and the Phoenix Suns. Now, I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll leave it up to you. Pretender or contender, the Utah Jazz, and pretender or contender, the Phoenix Suns. Utah Jazz is the 2021 Mil Milwaukee Bucks for the last two years. That's, that's who they are. I mean, I like Donovan Mitchell a lot, and I love traditional big men, but Utah is a second round and bounce. The Phoenix Suns are scary. You know why? Because they got CP3. And I told everybody he should be an MVP candidate. He should be. Everywhere he goes, they win. It's not a popularity contest. Can we get back to what people deserve? It's about impact. And, and Phoenix is not a playoff team. He shows up in your top two. You have to give him credit for that. You know what I'm saying? So they're scary because he's there. That's it. Yeah. Um. To be honest, uh. I feel similar, similar, similarly about the Utah Jazz, but I think they're pretty for real this year, and I'll tell you why. Last season, they went relatively deep into the playoffs. Now they're fully healthy. They have uh, Boyan Bogdanovich, who's their you know three-point shooter, back. Um, Jordan Clarkson is easily the sixth man of the year, and they added yeah. more pieces. They just added Ersan Ilyasova to their bench, and they have other guys stepping up. Mike Conley uh, got the all-star nod. You know, some people aren't, weren't too crazy about that one. I wasn't. I, I felt DeRozan or Shea Gilchrist Alexander deserved it. But whatever, that being said, they had all those all-stars. So I could see them making noise. And I agree with you with the Suns. Chris Paul at the helm of that team. 
you know, they're playing terrific. Got to give credit to James Jones, the GM, and Monty Williams, the head coach. So, yeah, I'm excited to see what happens with them. For sure. For sure. All right. So before we begin and before we introduce our guest, JB, the views and opinions expressed on this podcast are those of myself and, of course, yours, Jermaine's, and our guest. The episode can be seen on 730 The Game ESPN CLT Pod Center. YouTube or anywhere else where you get your podcasts. Our words do not reflect the views and opinions of 7.30 The Game, ESPN, CLT, Pod Center. Not even those crazy thoughts of yours, JB, or any of the crazy stories our guest, who I'll introduce right now, will tell us. The seven foot three defensive monster, the man who led the nation in blocks per game in back-to-back years from 94 to 96, and the NCAA's all-time leader in blocks per game with 6.4 three-year NBA veteran with the LA Clippers, and one of the nicest guys you'll ever meet, Jermaine's buddy, Keith Boss Kloss. Keith, welcome to the show. Pleasure to be here, fellas. Now, Jermaine, you and Keith go way back, of course. Uh, 15 years ago, Keith, you were just telling me this story. You guys met at the NBA Long Beach Summer League. You guys have different perspectives from how you met, who was trash talking who. So, JB, let me hear your story, and then, Keith, let me hear your story about when you met the trash talking JB, uh, this is this is this is a, a very simple story. My story should be the only one that counts. Like um, <laughs> you got to understand that this is a high prestige situation. L.A. was basketball to us because, of course, ten years prior, Kobe was at the Long Beach Summer League. So when we got there, uh, we could just watch. So I saw Keith, you know, somebody I grew up watching and always talked about as if everybody knows in my cartoon. So I'm like, man, you know, texting my friends, like, you know, I'm watching Keith play, you know, whatever, whatever. And then just by chance, luck, we got invited to the Drew League later that night. So when I made it to the Drew League, we were playing with the Arizona club. So I'm excited, you know. So I was raised around Muhammad Ali. So the only thing I understand is when you're scared and nervous, just talk trash, you know what I'm saying? Because you have to perform after that because now they're paying attention to you. So, you know, you score and, you know, I'm running my mouth and everything. And Keith is just giving me this look the whole night. I go down, you know, and I take off. Look, I tried to dunk on Keith and he put it on the glass. And I'm like, you know, I don't give a F. I'll be right back there. He said, country, country, shut up, shut up. And I didn't know what he was trying to tell me. He was forewarning me about my atmosphere. I didn't understand atmosphere at this time. I didn't understand L.A. culture at this time. I was doing way too much talking to everybody and the walls were closing in on me and I didn't realize. So he told me to shut up. And as we continue to play, he educated me on how to carry myself. Nothing wrong with being competitive, but it's a way you do everything and always know where you are. You know, so um, that was a, that was a great life lesson for me. I always tell that story, but uh, it was the best experience of my life. You know, um, I was very grateful at the time for, his humility towards me. He didn't have to do that. He could have been an ass and, you know, saying whatever, you know, you're going to learn the hard way. Welcome to LA type thing. He didn't do that. You know, he was very patient and humble with me and he helped me through that whole process. I was there for a week. Keith was there with me every step of the way. And Keith, tell the audience exactly who was in the crowd and who might have, you know, rung JB's bell, (laughs) so to speak, and what he could have ran into that day. Man, it was a who's who of Bloods and Crips and Pyrus from throughout LA and the surrounding community. And, you know, everybody comes to the Drew League to uh to cheer on their favorite player from their community. Everyone knows that the Drew League is a safe zone for families, it's family friendly. So the outside drama is not invited there. You know, um, we don't tolerate it. But JB's talking smack to, you know, the favorite players of these people. And uh I'm noticing the, the body language, of course. So, yeah, I told my country, man, shut your ass up and just play, you know, um, because there's, I'm hearing the whispering, you know, and they're plotting on this dude, you know what I mean? And uh, you think it was a truce of 92 with the Bloods and Crips coming together just, just for this one purpose, whoop his ass, <laughs> you know? And uh, I couldn't let that happen to him because he didn't know. And it was part of my responsibility as an elder statesman in basketball to make sure that I educate him like I would any other young player about what's going on in a, you know, in their surroundings, whether we're on the court 
or outside, you know, doing something else involved with life. But uh, yeah, he, he learned from it. He learned from it real quick. And, real quick. Uh, yeah, because once he got a good look at, you know, like, damn, damn. <laughs> <laughs> and I told him, you long way from Georgia, you know. And, uh, but you know what? Everything he said that he was going to do in that court, he did. He busted their asses. He was calling them out, coming down court. And then he started talking shit telling me what he was going to do to him. So me being who I am, I engage in that type of shit. I like it. So I started talking shit to him, telling him what I was going to do to his teammates. We going back and forth. JB, remember when I told you I was going to switch off on you on a pick and roll? And then I was going to block it off your head? <laughs> what happened? <laughs> look, I, look, I already brought up that you uh, pit my dunk on the glass. We don't have to talk about it no more. You know what I'm saying? I, if I said it, there's no need to bring it back up. Yeah, but I want, I want to talk about that part though, because you you conveniently hey, said hey, I left that. Hey, one Mike, out. Mike, keep going, keep going. And, He's gonna make well, this first. You know, for for all the listeners, <laughs> this is for all the listeners listening. This is a young JB just getting a taste into you know pro ball, seeing all these head honcho guys in that league, and of course he's going up against Keith Kloss, the NCAA's all-time leader in block shots. Already played with the Clippers so far. So JB, man. I got to give it to you. You were going, you were talking some smack to these pros. Well, you got to understand, you gotta understand that was our culture. That was our culture at that time. So we grew up watching Keith and them play. It was only the strong survive. There was no friendship ball. There was no, hey, can you help me? That was, no, you come in here and you, you know, you're ready for war. And the thing about us, I think that Keith respected so much. We knew our stuff. We knew who Keith was, and we honored and respected what he had accomplished. We saw what Keith was doing in the NCAA. Like, how do you block six shots a game like me and Mike talked about? It was like it was incredible to us. Keith was the guy we picked on NBA Live. Like, I think people really get the misconception about the times. If Keith plays now, he's AD. But nobody believes He's not tell them this, but he was 7'4", he had ball skills, he guarded guards, he could shoot the three, and he jumped out of the gym. Back then, it wasn't fashionable. It was Shaq. It was Duncan. It was Bark, not Duncan, but it Elijah was Barkley's, Malone's, Elijah ones. You had to play around that rim. You had to be tough. You listen to them old X-Men, McDaniels, Bill LeBeers, like, get tough. You never show weakness. So if you're Keith Kloss with the ultimate supreme skill set, the finesse game wasn't in then. You had to be a bruiser or you don't play. That's that's the way it was, right. Mike. And that's right. Now, Keith, in your opinion, do you think that was why you went undrafted? Because man, your stats at Central Connecticut, like twelve points per game, eight rebounds per game, and seven blocks. I mean, how how much better can you do to to you know not get drafted? You know, uh, my college coach Mark Adams, he always stressed the importance of team basketball. So, you know, while my, my offense stats could have been much higher, I always remember what he taught us, what he, what he preached to us. And I made it more about us than about myself. And so getting to the next level undrafted, you know, I, I, had, a, I had a serious, you know, uh, problem. I had a serious, serious problem with everybody, a chip on my shoulder, you know, because um, it was like, how dare you? pass up on me of all people and when I'm able to do so many great things on the court, you know, where I was a different breed of player. You know, yeah, I'm 7'3". Yeah, at the time I weighed 212 pounds when I got uh, when I entered the draft, you know. Um, but I could run like a gazelle. You know, I could jump. You know, I could shoot. I could handle. I could pass. Defense was there, you know, whether it was on the perimeter or on the block. Uh, I felt like I had something to prove and, you know, I was going to bust everybody's ass when I came up against them. You know, so, so the Summer Pro League gave me that opportunity. And I played with the L.A. Lakers, you know, with the young Kobe Bryant, Derek Fisher. And, uh, you know, that was my platform to bust everybody's ass. And Kobe, you know, he recognized that. He already knew. And he started giving me the ball consistently, you know. And the coach, our coach at the time, it was Kurt Rambis and uh, Dale Harris. And, you know, they let us 
they let us get loose, man, and they really let me go on my bag. So every once in a while, you know, you see me popping, you know, jumpers and coming off the screens, you know, playing at the small forward position and, and just doing my thing. Uh, it was a difficult transition once I did sign with the L.A. Clippers because now, as J.B. mentioned before, I'm in an era of solid play from the perimeter where they play inside out. Patrick Ewan, David Robinson, Hakeem Olajuwon, you know, Shaquille O'Neal, the most dominating big man of my generation. So these are the guys that I have to prepare for. And they thought I was just too thin in the ass and didn't have the basketball IQ of how to use my agility, you know, to my advantage. Um, so as a result of that, and me not being able to gain weight because of my high metabolism, I did a lot of sitting, did a lot of watching. But while I was sitting and watching, I was studying my opponents. You know, they give us they give us a, uh, a scout report for every game, leading up to every game with every player, 1 through 15, meaning the guys on injured reserve in case they get called, you know, in case somebody gets hurt and they had to suit up. We got to know everything about everybody. So they made sure that we did. And I took it seriously, you know, because I'm from the era where we study the game because we got to know what the competition is bringing to the table. You know, it wasn't like today with social media where everybody's posting everything and you could just punch a button. You see a highlight mixtape that some kid or some player put up. You know, we actually had to watch film, you know, and the breakdowns of film and then go along with that scout report as well. The likes and the dislikes. I would key in on the dislikes and play them to that, you know, once I got on the court. So of course, give myself an advantage to help my teammates out, you know, and they didn't know what to, what to make of me because the Clippers had limited me so much on what I was able to do. Like I was put on jumper restriction. Here I am. I grew up playing on the perimeter the majority of my life. I get to the highest level, but because I'm seven three, now they tell me they don't want me to handle the ball. They don't want me to shoot, but because I excelled in shot blocking in college, you know, that's all they knew about. That's all they were. That's all they allowed themselves to really recognize about. You know, I'll tell you something real quick, quick story. So my rookie year, we're playing against the Cleveland Cavaliers. I check in and I'm, you know, the coach is walking me to the scores table. He says, Keith, all I want you to do is rebound, play defense, block shots. That's all I want you to do. He's stressing it. So I say, yeah, okay, coach. And I give a look back to my teammates and I'm walking past. They give me this. And you know what that means. Go do your thing. I get on the court. They got seven threes of good, uh, the Junas of Goskis, same height as me, a little heavier, about 50 pounds heavier than me. Doesn't matter. Get out there, first possession. I get the ball. And I mix them real quick, break them, go to the basket and dunk on someone, right? So the next possession down, I hit them with, you know, another breakdown, step back, fade away, you know. Then I go ahead and dunk on him. So I go a quick six to six. The next day at ball, the coach meets me at half court. He cusses me out all the way back to the end of the bench because that's not what he told me to do. You know, I didn't play for the next 10 or 15 games because of that. It's it's crazy to hear that because I'm so used to this new generation where that is what matters. Like JB was saying, you know, that's what every coach wants to see. You go out there and dominating and you being so, you know, stuck in this shell of what the coach wants, the system, you know, I'm, I'm sorry to say it, that that hurt your career from not fully evolving. I'm sure you would agree. Right, right. Next thing I want to go into, JB, uh, is a story Keith told me yesterday when we were on the phone about Kobe Bryant. I know you mentioned the summer league before playing with Kobe, D. Fish, and those guys. Tell the audience about that story of when you coached Kobe and then, you know, a couple of days later or years later when he gave you that diss. Summer of 1995 going into my sophomore year in college. And uh, I was on the coaching staff at the ABCD camp, Teaneck, New Jersey, Farley Dickinson University. All the college players were the coaches. And uh, on my team, I had Kobe Bryant, uh, Tim Thomas, Lester Earl, and Jermaine O'Neal. We were spanking everybody 30, 40, 50 points a game. My guys weren't breaking a sweat. So after the game, I would make them run sprints, you know, because it was just too easy. After one game, Kobe decides he doesn't want to run. He gets an attitude and walks off the court while the rest of the team is doing sprints. 
I said, hey, Bean, what's going on, man? You know, you hurt? What's happening? He says, man, I, I ain't got to run no more. I don't want to run. I don't want to run. You know, we just won, man. I'm, I'm not running. I said, look, man, you're making yourself look bad in front of all these people. Your teammates are out here, you know, running. But you think you're different. So I'm just trying to prepare you for college because these coaches, man, they throw different things at you and you got to be mentally tough. You know, his dad comes down from the stands and he says, uh, Coach Claus, what's the problem? I said, you know, Bean doesn't want to run. He said, oh, he doesn't. Why not? He says that he doesn't have to because we won. I said, oh, is that right? Hold on. He said, boy, commit. So Kobe gets up and walks over to him and his dad, you know, punches him in the chest, you know, slides him across the floor in front of a, a gym packed full of people. It's about a thousand people in there, you know, and um, he knocks the wind out of Kobe. Kobe's sitting there gasping for air, you know, little tears coming down his cheek. And uh, he says, boy, don't you ever disrespect your coaches and don't you ever uh, embarrass your family like this. He said, your coach is right. You know, these, these coaches, they do tell you some crazy stuff. And he's just trying to prepare you. I tell you all the time, and now you're hearing it from somebody else who don't want to listen. He said, now get up and get out there and run with everybody else. So Kobe got out there, you know, crying and finished his sprints. Fast forward two years later, now he's got a year over me. He's got the seniority because he just finished his rookie year, and now I'm the rookie. After a, a big win, we smacked somebody by like 25, 30 points, and we're walking off the court. And he says to me, hey, Rook, hit the line. I already knew what time it was. You know, I started laughing at him. I said, all right, you got me. You got me. And uh, he told me, he said, uh, go. So I just started running my sprints with a big smile on my face, just laughing the whole time, running as hard as I could, you know, because I knew what that was about. You know, it was it was Kobe's revenge, you know what I mean? And it was just that lesson coming back to me about seniority, you know. Um, our, our families were sitting together, and my mom's trying to figure out what's going on, and you hear his mom and dad saying, boy, you ain't right for that. You ain't right, <laughs> you know. And um, I look over, and they're explaining to my mom what happened, what was going on. She says, you ain't got to do my baby like that. Why you do my baby like that? You know, but it was all good, man. It was a great experience, a great time to be uh, to be alive and playing basketball. I got a chance to play with one of the greatest to ever do it. Keith doesn't know this, but um, when he was with L.A., one of our Georgia legends, James Forrest, was with Keith. My man. And um, I was with James, and I was training with James when I was in college. And James would tell me about Keith because they all knew how I felt about Keith. He was like, I was with Keith in L.A. And here I am. I'm a draft pick. I'm a Georgia Tech legend. You know, and um, I get signed and I sign for $700,000. And he said, he was like, you know, Keith, if you can keep working hard, you know what I'm saying? Maybe you'll, you know, sign also. And Keith, he said, Keith laughed at him. He said, what you laughing at, man? You know, because him and Keith were close. It's not like Keith was making fun of him. He said, well, what are you laughing at? He's like, because I know something you don't know. He's like, what? He said, man, I'm about to get paid. He said, keep signing for five years, $10 million, which was unheard of at the time for an undrafted rookie. You know, so I found that story hilarious and also amazing, you know, because Gilbert Arenas was the first guy that went second round and lifted himself over all the lottery picks, and that's all people talk about. But Keith was the original guy that didn't get drafted that made more money than all the first round picks as a rookie, you know, and um, I, I checked on the salaries and everything myself and the story was accurate. He's making $2 million a year, you know what I'm saying? So I found that crazy that that thing went down. I want you to talk to me about that summer league with them and how you transitioned over to the Clippers and how you out, you know, you outwork lottery picks to get a five-year deal out of a rookie situation instead of the, you know, the normal, what did they get, the three-year, and they got to do the minimum until their time's over. Yeah, man. You know, uh, because of my performance with the Lakers, and uh, after that summer pro league was over, I went to Utah, Salt Lake, to play with the Portland Trailblazers in the Rocky Mountains. And now I'm teaming up with another former player that I coach. Now I'm with Jermaine O'Neal, you know. I'm with Rashid Wallace, Kelvin Cato, uh, Corey Beck out of Arkansas, and uh, a few other, Don Antonio Wingfield, uh, 6'8", do-it-all swing man, you know, who was real tough at the time. 
And now I get to play even more at the three when they have myself and Kelvin Cato on the floor with Jermaine. And, uh, you know, we had, a, we had a blast, man. You know, we're, we called ourselves a triple threat. You know, in the, in the big three, they got that team, the three-headed monster. Yep. You know, but we called ourselves a triple threat. And uh, because you get a ball to any of us, you know, we're, we're dunking on you. You know, Jermaine, he could step out a little bit on the perimeter. Kelvin was more around the basket. But, you know, then it was me who had the total package. So we're clowning guys, man. We're backing down our guys, you know. One of us would backdoor our man, and we just toss it up behind our head for a lob, you know. And we just had a blast doing that. And uh, one day after a game, walking to the locker room, Bill Fitch and Elgin Baylor sit the court side. Bill Fitch stops me. He says, young man, you know, one day, uh, he said, at the end of the summer, if you're not signed with the team, you're going to be wearing an L.A. Clippers uniform. And uh, I wasn't a Clippers fan. I grew up a Lakers fan. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar is the ultimate GOAT you know, in my eyes, and uh, I was going to be an, an L.A. Laker, you know. That's what my thinking was, not understanding that their roster was already set. And I would have just been going into camp as a crash dummy, you know. But the Clippers came at me, man, offered me five years, $8.4 million, which was, like J.B. said, unheard of for an undrafted rookie free agent, you know. But because of my performance during those two summer pro leagues, the way that I played out there and the way that I was able to dominate against guys who were much bigger than me, much stronger than me, you know, who were supposed to be much better than me because of those things. You know, I was awarded that contract. I had to pinch myself, man, to be honest, because it felt like I was in a dream. You know, my mom worked at City Hall, and that's where I signed that contract in the mayor's office. And I'm sitting there just pinching myself all over. You know, because, it, like I said, it seemed like a dream. This, this is too good to be true. That's amazing, man. That's that's amazing. I, I actually want to backtrack a little bit because I've known you for a long time, and I, I told you this from the beginning. I felt like it was completely fake what you were doing in college. And um, during that time, when I was a kid, you set the all-time leading record. You passed David Robinson when you uh, blocked 6.5 shots a season and you did it back-to-back -back and led the NCAA back-to-back. -back. Um, I, I thought that was just like the most incredible thing I had seen because I was big on the Sean Bradleys and everybody that was doing it at the time. Now, recently in the modern-day era, you were voted top five best shot blockers of all time in NCAA history, Bleacher Report. Um, how do you feel about that list and – how the hell do you block 6.5 shots a night? First of all, I didn't even know about the Bleacher Report uh, rankings, yeah. the, the list. That's awesome. That's awesome. Hopefully they got me uh, number one. I should be number one. But David Robinson probably is or Alonzo Mourning. You know, they got me at number five. You number five. Haters. Haters, man. <laughs> Haters. You know, shot blocking for me came naturally. I don't like being scored on. I don't like my teammates getting scored on. You know, you score on my teammate, I take that person. You know what I mean? And uh, basketball is a team sport. So I got to have your back just like I expect you to have mine out there. It was in, I hosted a block party every game, man. And the other team was always invited. You know, and I used to tell them that too. You know, hey, we're going to have a block party tonight. You guys are invited. You don't have to bring nothing. I got everything set up for you. <laughs> This guy was a savage, JB. And and Keith, uh, I got to ask you, you know, that big contract you signed. Before that, how are you hustling and getting money? And then all of a sudden, boom, two year, two, uh, $2 million a year coming out. Like, how do you adjust I'm, to that lifestyle? Well, you know, for the majority of my life, I grew up in a single parent home. You know, my mother did an amazing job raising four children. And, uh, you know, she just got up and went to work every day, you know, grinded it out for us. Uh, so the money that I had at the time was the little bit that she was able to give me because remember, she still had three other kids to take care of, you know? Uh, so I didn't grow up, you know, having money of my own, you know what I mean? And, uh, you know, when mom saw fit to give us something to reward us, you know, because of something that we were doing, you know, then that's what, 
That's what she did. And that's when I'd have five, ten dollars, which back then was a lot. You know, and it went a long way. People don't remember gas once upon a time was less than a dollar a gallon. You know, so you you put five dollars in the gas tank, boy, you driving all over the place. But that transition to not having my own money to now I've got not just five dollars, not just ten dollars, not just five thousand or ten thousand. You know, I've got eight point four million on paper. On paper, you know, and that's before tax, you know, but on paper now, I'm a multimillionaire. I thought I was gonna be a multi thousandaire, you know, at best after they didn't draft me, because now I'm thinking, damn, they're gonna screw me and I'm gonna get one of these uh low end, you know. Uh, contracts for at, at the time was 232 was the league minimum 232,000 you know which is why I said I thought I'd be a multi-thousand there <laughs> you know um, I was cautious at first you know because I didn't know what the hell to do with that you know I cashed my first check which was 60,000 I put it in my pillowcase and I would wake up and I would you know, empty it out, dump it out on the bed and just swim in it. Ah, like I didn't know what to do with it. But yeah, man, it was it was quite the transition because especially now I'm functioning with the people that I see on television all the time. You know, now I've elevated from a ZZ lister to a lister because now I'm in the NBA, you know, and uh, it was it was quite a transition. All right, Keith, so, you know, me knowing you personally, you know, um, but I know we can always speak freely, but um, you hit me to the culture of L.A. because I didn't understand it. And the more I was around you and then when I left and I did my research and my studying, I realized the culture that was there. And it's a it's an open reality of when the crack ep- epidemic happened to our people, you know, uh, right. what was going on with N.W.A. at the time. Uh, what Cube was trying to say after he branched out, the gang violence, you know, the Bloods and the Crips. Like, I didn't understand this, and a lot of people don't understand this, but it was a very, very big deal. Being raised in that culture your whole life and then transitioning into now I'm in NBA in the same exact city I came up in, how was that transition walking into the NBA your first couple of years, being rich? I had a hard time um, leaving some of that that stuff behind, you know. Uh, at the age of twelve, I joined the street gang, and I tried to bring that with me to the NBA. I thought I could, you know, be a game banger by a day, NBA player by a night, and it, you know, it just backfired on me. You know what I mean? I, I became a prime example of uh, when keeping it real goes wrong. Um, but you know. I still have all the family and friends around me. Uh, still got people reaching. I got all these, all these new cousins popping up. But uh, it was a, uh, it was still fun, man. It was still fun. Uh, at the same time, wherever I went, I had to watch my back, watch my surroundings, and I didn't always do a great job of that because I used to like to drink very heavily. You know, almost 14 years sober now, but back then. I'm just thinking I'm living my best life and enjoying everything that's going on around me. Uh, it was an eye opener, the things that, you know, I would be exposed to that I previously had no knowledge of, um, <laughs> you know, going to different parties, different events, you know, with these A-listers and, and seeing some pretty wild stuff. Um, mm-hmm. Man, oh, man. You know, I, I, listen, back. listen, listen, Keith. Uh-oh. I know, I know Uh-oh. how you feel because, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because li- listen, Mikey, <laughs> this is this is the road trips when me and Keith played together overseas. Like I used to get all the stories. You know what I'm saying? So we again, we talk about people like Gilbert Arenas that go to the arena with guns, or guys that are doing drugs, or guys that are drinking before games. I asked Keith. This is my first question to Keith as a humble young guy, Keith. You made $10 million. What'd you do with it? And Keith looked at me. He said, young fella, I either gave it to my family or I drunk it. And I was like, 
you know, this is my face, Mike. But I knew right then and there, like, my experiences with Keith were always genuine. He never lied to me. He wanted to help me to be a better person. He always wanted me to not make the mistakes he made. So I used to get these stories. So I bring up, like, the gun. It was common practice for all of them to have firearms. Like, Keith, you know what? Oh, JD, I had two, three, you know, <laughs> guns in my locker. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, we understand social media culture. This was Keith's culture before he ever hit the league. You know what I'm saying? And this is what I was gaining and understanding with him being there. You know, so I'm telling that story, Keith, to transition into what's next. The thing I asked you about was the goods. And for people that are too young to know what the goods means, that was Lamar Odom when he came out of Rhode Island. Keith was already in L.A. Lamar Odom comes into the picture, and this is the guy that's painted to be the next Magic Johnson. And he delivered that the first month of the league. And Keith was basically his overseer. Keith, you told me this guy was as advertised. You told me he was super talented. You told me that he loved the game out of your mouth. But you also told me he had a lot of stuff going on outside of the court. I would love for you to touch on LO. Yeah, man, he was he was uh he was the Rick James of our era. You know. Uh <laughs> man. I got a call one night from a local tribe, you know, that otherwise known as a gang. <laughs> and uh, they said, hey, man, you need to come get your rookie. I said, man, what, what, what rookie? What you mean? What's going on? He said, man, cuz out here hanging out the top of a limo buying up all the coke, you know. He said, but if you don't come get them, we just going to rob them and take our shit back. I, at the time, I'm at home. I'm smoking a blunt. I'm getting drunk myself. I said, man, y'all do what y'all got to do. You know, I, I don't care. It ain't none of my business. I hung up the phone. People think that because, you know, they think that all this stuff crept up once he started dating the Kardashian. False. He had those demons way back then coming into the league. You know, I wasn't in a position or in a mental mind frame that I'm in today, you know, uh, understanding what I understand about addiction. I wasn't in a position to say anything to him. You know, uh, I wasn't in the mind frame of that elder statesman looking after the next generation, the next woman behind me, the next man behind me. Because I didn't have that from the guys on the team, you know. So I didn't know what to tell him. Therefore, I didn't tell him anything. This dude... One one night, man, one of my one of my homeboys is riding with me to the game. We pull into the tunnel at the Staples Center. He sees a rival. He pulls out his strap. He's getting ready to shoot this dude in the Staples Center. So I grabbed the gun from him. I said, man, what you doing? He said, I got to work here tonight. You know, I take the gun and I, you know, I put it in my waistband, in my, you know, my suit. And I go on to the locker room. You know, I forgot that I had the gun on, you know, by this, you know, by this time, much later. And when I'm changing and everything, and the gun, I feel it. I said, oh, man, I forgot this was here. You know, I look around real quick. And Lamar's locker is off to the left of me. And so I look at him, and he's, you know, just staring at his wide eyes, you know. I just nod to him, what's up? Put it in my locker. Locked up, changed, get out there. Halftime, you know, um, okay, let me back up. He asked me to get him some weed. He asked me to get him some eggs. So I did that. And I, and I, gave, it, I gave it to him. Halftime, Jeff McKinnis comes running out the locker room. He country too. Boss, boss, man, them, them folks in your locker. Folks in your locker. I said, them folks, what folks? He said, man, them folks in your locker. I said, man, talk English. I said, man, the police in your locker. I said, my locker for what? I said, man, I was in there taking them, right? And I heard Lamar telling them, you know, telling them that you had a gun and you threatened to shoot them. And so now I'm scratching my head like, when did I ever say that? And I'm looking around on the court. We're warming up, preparing for the second half of this game. I don't see Lamar anywhere out there. So I'm like, okay, cool. You know, I, I'm, I'm not going to panic. Horn sounds. Just as he's coming out the tunnel, 
surrounded by LAPD, you know, uniformed officers. We break in the huddle. I go sit down. They come pat me on the shoulder. Mr. Claus, would you mind, you know, coming back here and have a few words with us for a moment? I said, oh, yeah, no problem. You know, I'm playing it cool. Get up. They take me right to the locker room. They've got some weed and some pills and a pistol on the floor outside my locker. They said, can you explain this? Now, I'm the only one at the time that know that my fingerprints on, you know. So I just started touching the stuff. I said, oh, man, where'd this come from? Where'd this come from? You know, oh, man, can you put that down? Can you put that down? You know, you're going to get your fingerprints all over. I said, oh, man, I'm, I'm sorry about that. You know, just playing a role. I said, look, I can't explain. I said, I know that's weed. I don't know what that is. I said, well, that's ecstasy, Mr. Claus. I said, ecstasy? I said, oh, man, I've heard about that. Isn't that like acid? You know, I'm just trying to play it off. Um, I said, look, there's a situation that I diffused. I had to disarm somebody, save somebody's life. And um, that happened on the way here. I said, so that's why I had the gun. I said, um, I had completely forgotten that I had it until I had changed and I couldn't go back out and, you know, put it in my truck, you know. Um, I said, so that's the story with that officer. And I said, all right, well, we got to run tests on everything and ballistics on the gun and, you know, make sure uh, that you're clear of any other charges. I said, okay, cool. You know, when Lamar came out that tunnel, I looked over at him and he, this was his response. He just dropped his head and dropped his eye, you know, and I just shook my head. You know, like, yeah, okay, I see what time it is. But he had those issues way before he uh, met Khloe Kardashian. You know, he had those issues back in New York. You know, he had those issues back, you know, back in college, you know, back in AAU and in high school. After that, you're still Lamar's teammate. What's what? What are the coming days, the coming weeks looking like with him, with your interactions? We go on a road trip. He tries to holler at my fiance at the time. You know, um, he comes up to me on a you know in Charlotte, and I brought her on a trip because I was going to propose to her. He says, "Man, boss, I know y'all get real freaky. I know how you are on the road when she ain't around. You know, I know when y'all together, you get real freaky." And I just write it off and laugh at him. I said, man, go ahead, young fella. You know, don't even think about that. He said, man, I just want to watch. Man, go ahead. You start agitating. You know, we get home. I find out that he's been calling her at 3, 4 o'clock in the morning, 5 o'clock in the morning, telling her that, you know, his his girl wants to hook up with her and that he's just going to watch, but don't tell me. And she was a nervous wreck telling me, that, you know, trying to tell me this because she knows I'm, I might do something. And uh, I had to promise her that I wasn't going to do anything, you know, before she would tell me. And when she did, you know, it was this was during a rough stretch. I had gotten into it with Michael Oliver Candy in a layup line in Minnesota, you know, right before the game. Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis had to break us up, you know, because I was about to whoop his behind on the, on the court warm-ups. And got into it with Maurice Taylor, you know, during practice. And, uh, you know, now this thing with Lamar. Once I get into it with Maurice at practice, that's what set it off. I'll leave practice. I'll go home. You know, it's a 10-minute drive. Come back in full gang gear. You know, I got my rag on my side around my head. I got a loaded AK-47 with a banana clip over my shoulder. I walk in to the, to the gym that we were at. I take out the clip, take out a round toss it to Lamar, take out a round, toss it to Mike, take out another round, toss it to uh, Maurice. Lamar said, what's this, son? What's this, son? I said, look, tired of being nice. I'm giving you passes long enough. Only reason you're able to enjoy yourselves in LA is because I say so. I make sure you have a good time. I make sure that you stay safe. I make sure that you keep your jewelry. I make sure that you stay alive. I said, the next time I toss one of these at you, you're not going to catch it, you know? And I snatched them back, wiped them down, got all the prints off of them as I'm reloading them back into the clip, lock one into the brain, put it back over my shoulder, and I leave from practice. And as I'm walking out of the gym, Elgin Baylor's coming in. 
you know, my teammates, they're just stuck. They're just looking, you know, because this is a scene out of a movie and uh, boys in the hood in real life, you know, <laughs> and Elgin walks past me and he's got this stunned look. He's this big ass AK-47 over my shoulder. He says, Keith, what's going on? I said, Elgin, I'm tired of this shit. I don't know how much longer I can do this, you know? So they're going to stop playing with me. Matter of fact, all of you are going to stop playing with me. And I left, you know, I drove down to South Central LA, hung out in the hood with my homies for the rest of the day. And that's unfortunately the reality of the culture and the time. You know what I'm saying? Like, it, it really is. And I had to grow to learn that. But I want to change gears for a second. Uh, me and Mikey have a sound bite from a, I want to say NBA TV at the time. I don't want to yeah. quote the wrong show. But we have a sound bite, uh, NBA TV. Well, Shaq said. Uh, that night, it was my birthday, and we had a party. So, you know, usually, uh, <laughs> so usually I go home. Before eat. or after the game? <laughs> no, after the game. <laughs> 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 I was like, yeah, party. In the game. <laughs> big party. So, you know, usually I go home, eat lunch, take a nap, and get ready for the game. But we playing against the great Keith Kloss and the L.A. Clippers. <laughs> so I'm taking the night off. I got to get ready for the party. I got the Bentley, I got my suit, so I'm gonna go, you know, out, uh, out shade, we are gonna beat them. So great, we get out there and they and they killing us. Now everybody looking at me. So now I got to play, I didn't get my nap, I'm getting tired, so I'm, I'm, just, I'm just scoring. So I look over to the bench and I see one of my idols telling Keith Claus how to stop me. I see Kareem saying, you got to do this, you got to do that. <laughs> now I'm pissed. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Kareem, like, uh, oh, now, so I'm like, give me the ball. So I'm, I'm scoring, I'm scoring, and you know, I get 61, I'm throwing lobs, and so Six, we was, right. 61, points, yeah. 61 points, 61 points, 23 yeah. rebounds yeah. against I was hot. Keith Claus. Hot. Video game. The great. Yeah. And still great. went to the party. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he got upset because the great Kareem Abdul-Jabbar took a liking to you more than him, and he got jealous. He wanted Kareem to be invested in him, but Kareem liked you more. These are just the facts. I studied it. Then he said he proceeded to give you 61 points because of his jealousy. But I was the one that stood and said, Keith didn't even play in this basketball game. Where did that come from? Why did he make that up? There's no way you can score 61, and in all the highlights, Keith is on the sideline, but you swear in your mind that you gave Keith the 61. Where did this come from, and what was the deal with you and Shaq? I was a young jerk back then, especially towards Shaq, and uh, for no good reason at all, other than uh, I didn't like him because he was 7'1", 360, and made life hell playing against him. That was like the Clippers' punishment for me. You know, we're going to give you some good minutes tonight, you know, when we played against the Lakers. So, yeah, I didn't play that game when he scored that 61. I was sitting on the side in a tailor-made gray walker suit playing with my infant son at the time. You know, I used to, I used to mess with his women. I used to snatch his women. And uh, one game, man, I'm, I'm drunk before the game, Mikey. And we're playing against the Lakers. <laughs> and I said, I said, hey, you like that? You see that suit I got on tonight? You like that? He's like, yeah, yeah, big key. I like that. That's real nice, man. That's real nice. I said, yeah. I just want to say thank you. You got that for me. He looked at me. He was like, what? I said, yeah, well, so-and-so got it for me. I know that's your money, so I'm thanking you. And his eyes got big. Give me the ball. Give me the ball. Kobe's, you know, we're running up and down the court, you know, and I'm still talking, you know, and I'm just dropping names. And uh, Kobe's telling me, he said, man, Keith, what's your problem, man? You trying to die? You know, why? Why would you say something like that to this man? Man, look, ain't nobody scared of him. I said, he could do with everyone on this court and get away with it. Once we step off that court, you know, that ass is mine, you know. And uh, I said, ain't that right, big fella? And smacked him on the ass, you know, running down the court. And uh, that, that, look, Mikey, he fouled me out real quick, right? Swole up my arm. I'm a shot blocker. Going after everything. He tried to break my arm in the rim, Mike. But after the game, my arm up, you know, with ice, it's swollen from wrist to elbow. My forearm is swollen. I can't put on that nice tailor-made suit, you know. I got to have it. I had to have help buttoning it and then, you know, have my arm slinged coming out of it. So I got the sleeve just hanging there with no arm in it. Come out the game like that after 
game. He says, hey, Keith, how's that suit fitting now? I said, man, forget you, man. You know, but Shaq has a – he has a, a great sense of humor. He's a, he's a big kid. He's a big clown like myself, like JB. You know, a lot of us just like having a good time and laughing about everything and anything. And that's what that was about for him, you know, along with the little get back for the, for the trash. I used to talk to him and the few personal jabs I took at him, you know, back in the day. But uh, when I first heard it, man, I'm sitting in the AA meeting. I'm like three years sober at the time, three, four years sober. I'm, I'm still trying to get, I'm still trying to get all that trash thinking from the past out of, you know, and somebody's texting me and saying, man, Shaq just, you know, spoke up about you on NBA TV, said they scored 61 on you. And then I get another text from somebody else. And then I get a Twitter notification with video clip. And I'm, I'm sitting there heated, you know, and, I just get out of pocket and start texting all kind of personal stuff to him and a few threats, you know. And uh, Steve Smith sent me a DM on Twitter. It's a big fella. Why are you so mad about this? What's going on? I had to explain to him, Steve, I didn't even play that game. And for him to go on live television and lie on me like that, that's not cool. You know, that was that, that was that street mentality coming out for me right there. You know, uh, Okay, you lying on me in, in in a big in a big way. You know, you got this huge platform and millions of people are watching this. They won't really think that this really happened to me. I gotta have some give back now. You know, Steve said, "Big fella, if it didn't happen, just let it go." You know how he is. You guys like to clown around, and have fun. Just let it go. And uh, I thought about it. I said, Damn, he's right. So I made an amends to him on Twitter. You know, I actually made an amends on Twitter to Shaq about that. And uh, not too long after that, maybe a few months or a year later, he came clean and admitted that, you know, it wasn't me and that I didn't play that game. You know, uh, but everywhere I went, because people, this is the power of social media, Mikey, everywhere I went, people believed it. That's why Shaq busted your ass and gave you 61 points on his birthday. My man, look, well, it's even today, Mike, but even today, they post it, right? I'll, I'll run a random search of my name on Twitter just to see the wild stuff that's being said about, you know, I die at least twice a year because of the Keith Claw's death, you know, at least twice a year, man, since then the advent of Twitter, you know, I die. And uh, every year they post a video of me getting jumped back in 2000. I laugh about that and I repost it, and I, and I, you know, Hashtag good times, you know. Um, and then that 61-point game, and please find in a box score how many minutes I played. You know, and then you'll get a response a couple of days later. Oh, man, my bad, but he said. Mm -hmm. That's just the power of social media, man, yeah. and of yeah. certain people. Yeah, they, they say something and run with it because nobody really does their true information seeking to find it. But, you know... Right. Right. That 2000 incident you were just talking about, you know, getting jumped. It was like, what was it, Keith? Like 30 guys against one. You weren't even hurt. You're like big Frankenstein out there just taking punches. Crazy, crazy video that I'll put over it. But I'd like for you to touch on that. But also, did NBA players you were going against, like you kind of warned Shaq, did they know you were like gangbanging off of the court and you were this hard guy off the court? Yeah, they knew. They knew. Um, everybody knew it, except for I tried to downplay it with the NBA. But I made a mistake back at that camp in 95 when I spoke to the kids about, you know, uh, the pressures of life and, you know, the pressures of the neighborhood and joining gangs and my own involvement. I forgot that I had mentioned that, you know, and so they already had their radar on me. Uh, and when things were going down in L.A., because back then, a lot of players started getting jacked for jewelry and rap artists from out of town. Remember the gold grills and the ice, the ice chains that became a big deal back then, the trend. And, uh, so the gangbangers in LA would start jacking these dudes. And because of my relationships with certain people in certain neighborhoods, I would go get that stuff back and I would put it in my stash spot in my truck, 
you know, right along next to my pistol and, you know, get in contact with this person and tell them, hey, I got your grill back. Hey, I got your chain back. You know, I got your watch back. I got your rings back. You know, and you got to be careful, you know, when you're out here, avoid these places, even though it may sound good, it may sound inviting. Avoid these places so that these things don't happen. You know, or holler at me and I'll tell you the safe zones for us. You know, or I'll go meet up with you. I was in a club with Kenny Anderson one night, man, and somebody said something real foul to him. And so Kenny retorted. And uh, I knew the dude big time, you know, shot call. And he was about to have his little goons jump on Kenny. I got up and I whispered in his ear, hey, man, you know, it's a real good dude, you know, give him a pass because he don't deserve nothing like that. You know, I never shared this with Kenny. This is the first time I'm sharing it. You know what I mean? And uh, but I, I, I used to do stuff like that. You know, I used to look out for a lot of people and make sure that they were okay. In the NBA, remembering my gang ties, when things went down involving NBA players, they would fly me to New York and give me the third degree. You know, we know you were there. We know you had something to do with it. They're going to tell us everything. You know, the majority of the time, I wasn't even there. You know, I can think of one incident where I was actually there, where some shots were fired inside of a club, I'm on the dance floor with my girlfriend when this happened, you know, and, uh, but because our assistant equipment manager was there and he saw me there. Now Keith Claus was there and here I am in New York, third degree all over again. You know, uh, it was, it was crazy times. It was definitely crazy times, man. I'm the first guy to go viral on a cell phone. <laughs> footage, you know, getting jumped by by 20 guys. All that was about was arguing with my son's mother about, you know, who's at home with the kids. And, you know, he's three months old at the time. Where is he? There were some choice words that I used that weren't very colorful and weren't very cool, but I used them many ways out of my anger and frustration. And some gang members stepped up to defend her and uh, they didn't like what I had to say to them in response and it quickly escalated to some street stuff so that's you know it went from a, a regular domestic thing to you know now all of a sudden it's street violence it's one thing that we really haven't touched on that i do want to touch on that's huge we got clips of you scoring on my goat michael jordan we got you playing against shaquille o'neal kobe bryant grant hill like you were in the golden era of basketball. And I tell everybody that it's not personal. It's just the truth. Cause that's not even my era. Like I am in the generation of LeBron James. People don't realize that they always saying it's hating or whatever, but that's my era. But I'm here to say that the eighties and nineties were the best for somebody that got to be out there with Michael Jordan. I would like to know personally, well, you've already told me, but I want the world to hear it coming from your mouth. You out there touching him. He's touching you. And for some reason, every time y'all play Chicago, Mike guarded you. I don't know what that was about, but Mike loved guarding you. But I want to know what it was like just watching him because people would pay top dollar just to be in his presence. You had the opportunity to play against his man a minimum of 12 times. I want to hear what it was like being next to him and watching him perform. Man, Mike was amazing. You know, uh, he was everything that everybody said about him, you know, and so, you know, uh, it was always exciting to play against him because you are, you didn't want to look bad. You didn't want Mike to make you look bad. And so I stepped it up defensively and they happened to play me a small forward against the Bulls. And uh, Mike was playing a small forward and, and with their rotation at the time, you know, when the coaches matched me up with them. I loved it. I was a nervous wreck at first. You know, I went out there and forgot that I had my shooting pants on, you know, and uh, had to take them off and get back out there. But I had to think to myself, man, this is basketball. This is what I love to do. This is what I get paid millions of dollars to do. Okay, I got to guard Michael Jordan. Who? Guess what? Michael Jordan's got to guard me. You know, he's never had to guard anybody like me. 
So now that's my mindset. I got to flip on everything and go on my bag for him. We know what you got, Mike, but now you're going to see what I got. That just made the game a lot of fun, man. You know, yeah. he didn't talk a lot of smack. He just look at you. You know what I mean? He just give you that look to that gum. He made you elevate or, and, and if you didn't elevate, guess what? You crumble and you're useless to your team and you got to stay, you know? Yeah. And, and in the, in those nineties, JB, I just want to jump in with this one, Keith, who was a, who was the toughest center to go against? Cause that was the golden era of the center. We mentioned Ewing, Shaq, Elijah Wan, and all them back then. Who was your toughest matchup? My toughest matchup was uh, Shaquille O'Neal by far because of the, just the brute strength and athleticism of that guy. Um, if we want to say skill-wise, Hakeem Olajuwon, he was a total package, man. He was a guard and a big man's body who could do it all. You know, um, I wanted to be a little bit like him as well. You know, not just have my own sky hook like Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, but to be able to do all the other things just like I saw him doing. Everybody has to remember when he dominated Shaq in the 95 playoffs, you know, and he, he made him look like a kid out there. Shaq had some moments, of course, but Kane really went in his bag and showed him what time it was. You know, David Robinson was a little tricky because he was a lefty like me who could also step out and shoot, you know, who was very athletic and could jump out of the gym. Alonzo Mourning, strength, you know, very fundamental. Uh, a little robotic in his and what he did, but effective. Dikembe Mutombo, shot blocking extraordinaire. You know, defensive genius out there. It was it was just a lot of fun, man. It was a lot of fun because these are guys whose cards I collected, and now I'm out there, you know, battling with them. It was a lot of fun. It was a lot to learn too. A lot of people don't know this, and I'll share this story. But um, when I finally had my opportunity. Uh, to go to the league. The last time I seen Keith was in 2006, 2007. That was the last time I saw him when I was 22 years old. The next time I seen Keith, well, not necessarily seen Keith, heard from Keith is when I got called up to the Minnesota Timberwolves. Now, I'm in Slam Magazine, and everybody's saying, when is this guy going to get an opportunity? Because I had all this, this underground buzz for minor leagues, you know, and I was I was that guy. So Slam Magazine did article, just scored 60 points in a game, Mikey. They were at the game. It was just luck of the draw. They were there. And the NBA was going to come call it. And when I got the call from uh, Flip Saunders, Sam Mitchell, Keith was the first guy. Keith was the first guy to step up online, Slam Magazine or whatever and say, because it was, it, was, it was guys saying congratulations, but it was also a lot of hate. And Keith stepped in and validated me to the world. On, on Slam Magazine, oh, they have a thread. And he said, I know that kid. I played with that kid. That kid was in L.A. He deserves it. And he is as good as advertised. And I never, I never forgot that. You know what I'm saying? So I reached out to Keith and I told him, you know, thank you personally. And this is when Keith had went sober and he was changing his life. And me and Keith started talking more and doing more, and then we ended up playing together overseas. And a lot of people don't know these stories, so I'm going to tell you. We had guys that would come on these trips with us. We had, we had this, this one kid from Canada that came, came with us. And Bad they man. signed the kid. To, yeah, they signed the kid Bruce to come Wayne. on. And the kid was doing drugs. He was doing heavy drugs, like heavy drugs. He was doing cocaine or whatever. So the local drug dealers in this particular city we was playing in we're about to kill the kid. So me and Keith get off the bus to go up to check on the kid. The kid is on the roof of the hotel, sunbathing naked with cocaine on his nose. They're about to kill the kid. Keith talked to the dudes. Keith talked to the dudes and convinced them not to kill this kid. And this is the type of stuff that a lot of people don't know about that really go on and that really happen. Keith was, the, I guess what I'm trying to say is this. When you do a lot of bad in the world, metaphorically speaking, the next half of your, your life, you do so much good. My experiences around him, because I was around him 10 years straight, the only thing he tried to do was save people's lives. That's the only thing he tried to do, educate people and save their life. Every second of the day, 
And he breathed that life into everything we did and everything that was around me. So for me personally, from a childhood kid that looked up to a guy, he was everything that was advertised to me growing up and being an adult. You know what I'm saying? So I always felt like I had to defend the guy. So whether he was fighting one on 30 and they said, your boy got jumped on. I have to fight for him. He didn't even know. I We didn't know each other or nothing like that. I felt that that bond and then that bond became true. You know what I'm saying? So it meant a lot more to me, you know? So to watch a, a, a man go from a, a poverty situation to abusing drugs and to losing his career and to turn around and say, hey, I did this to myself and it's not the end of the world because I can save you. And if I save you, that's more important to me than anything I could have did. I mean, that's what I want everybody to understand. He's a we guy. He's never been a me guy. Even when he was doing everything he was doing, he was still we. Everything was about we to him, you know, and I witnessed that and I saw that firsthand, you know, my whole professional career being around Keep Claw. So, you know, we're on here live saying this, man, I appreciate you. You know, uh, you saved my life and you improved my life and you helped me as a young man and as a basketball player. And we don't have enough people that are OK with making mistakes and then changing and becoming something that's saving our culture, you know, so it's really important to me that me and Mikey did this show, you know, so um, that might be a little bit premature to tell those stories before we wrap up, but that had to be said. Appreciate it, man. Uh, I love you too, little bro. Oh, God, here he go. <laughs> and, uh, here he go. And Keith, That's what he wanted, uh, Mikey. That's what he wanted. <laughs> to piggyback off that, Keith, after all those years, <laughs> after all those years of alcoholism and you know um, abusing drugs and your NBA career coming you know to an end, when did it click in your head that you had to get sober, and it would be life changing to do so? <laughs> when I came to on life support in the hospital, <laughs> that's when, you know, actually came to. I plugged up to all these machines, Mikey. And I don't know what's going on. So I started taking tubes out of my mouth, out of my arms. You know, I'm taking monitors off my chest. The machine goes crazy as though I died. The crash team rushes in. My voice is, you know, kind of scratched up because of the tubes. And, uh, you know, they thought I died. So they're rushing in, ready to, you know, save me. And I asked the doctor, you know, what happened? Where am I? How did I get here? He said, kid. You almost died in the emergency room. Um, we had to put you on life support to save your life, you know. And he asked me, say, how much do you drink? I said, well, I haven't had a drink in six months. I said, really? He said, because from the test that we ran on you, your numbers are, are you know, they're just, they're just crazy, insane. I said, well, I haven't drank in six months. But when I did drink, I was a heavy drinker. You smoke weed too, right? He said, well, I got to quit that. He said, yeah, because aren't they testing now? You play ball. Um, but it was, it was that moment, man, in that hospital bed, once I pulled those machines out and this dude telling me that I almost died from, you know, as a direct result of the alcohol. If you had one piece of advice to a current NBA player, a troubled kid, what would it be? Be, be true to yourself. You know, be honest to yourself, reach out to somebody, you know, talk to somebody. Um, don't try to figure everything out on your own. You know, get somebody that you can trust that that's not a yes man and who truly does have your best interests at heart. You know, because only then will you uh, receive the true answers that you seek. Incredible advice. All right, Keith. Now it's time for Truth for Truth, our segment where we put you on the spot about topics from your career. Do you solemnly swear that you will tell the truth and nothing but the truth in this segment? You can't handle the truth. I solemnly swear. So help me God. <laughs> so help you God indeed. But uh, first off, I want to keep it NBA. Who's your GOAT? Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. 
and why? Why? The man was a proven winner from high school all the way through, you know, college to the NBA. He dominated. They changed, the, they changed the game. They changed rules for him. You know, they outlawed the slam dunk in college basketball because of this man. But what did he do? See, people thought he was just a sky hook. Kareem had an all-around game. He had a crazy fadeaway off the glass, you know, out to 15, 16 feet. People didn't know that about him. But if they go back into the archives and they see, you know, what this man really did, you know, he, he's the GOAT. He won three straight NCAA championships in college. He only lost two games. One of the games they lost because, you know, he was half blind, you know, in one eye. Um, the other game was a fluke. You know, the other loss was a fluke as well. But, uh, man, he would have won four straight NCAA championships had a freshman been allowed to play back then. Because when they scrimmaged their varsity team when he was a freshman, they smashed them. You know, they smashed them convincingly. Uh, but, yeah, they changed rules because of this guy. You know, he's not the all-time leading scorer in NBA history for nothing. I mean, I give you that. I don't think most people will argue uh, when you say Michael Jordan's the greatest. They'd be like, what about Kareem? It's like, I, I can't really argue because he was just that special. I'm going to move forward. I'm going to twist it up a little bit. I'm going to take it a little bit away from basketball. Seeing that I know a piece of information – now, I read, and we'll stick to read, I heard that you and a colorful-haired guy, I won't say his name, but he had colorful hair, a guy with colorful hair yes. who also played yes, alongside Michael Jordan, and he, he could have been a bad boy, was dating uh, uh, a star of videos, and you guys, you two, competed in a gambling debt on who could do what to what. Is this story true or false, Mr. Cross? It's very true. I want to hear it. I'm not going to say it, but I want to hear it. Mikey wants to hear it, too. So me and this guy with the colorful hair were at a party. <laughs> he tells me, hey, Keith, grab something and follow me. I'm thinking he means a drink. I got my red plastic cup here. I already got something. He says, no, grab you something. He grabs a woman. You know, and uh, who was part of a uh, a TV show called uh, American Gladiators? And uh, I do something. He grabs her. He says, "Follow me." I said, "Oh, okay, I got you." So I grabbed me something. Who happened to be, you know? That something happened to be a star of uh, some te adult television movies. And um, you know, he's a you know, we head to the pool table. He's at one corner pocket. I'm at the other corner pocket. And uh, he pulls out 10 grand, slaps it in the middle of the table, says, I bet you this 10,000 that you'll finish before I do. So me being the competitor that I am, Mikey, I reach into my pocket, my wallet, and I pull out $10,000, so I match them. And we go to work. And instead of concentrating on, you know, our TV personalities, uh, we're concentrating on each other, just talking smack back and forth. You know, and a lot of the language I can't use here, so I won't. But, um, he yells, and I'm thinking I won. And so I'm scooting the money over to me, and I started making the pain on her, and I don't I don't break stroke, you know, while this is happening. And, you know, he yells one more time, and I turn to see what the world is going on. And peripherally, I, I like, look, I look men eye to eye at all times. But your peripheral will pick up things. You know, and my peripheral picks something up. And what it picked up was very disturbing. And, you know, something had that was once this way was now this way. And, you know, that was very traumatizing. I had to rush this guy to the hospital, you know, at his own party. And, uh, you know, my brand new custom, my tailor-made camel hair trench coat, you know, three-quarter trench coat. I had to cover him up with it. And he bled all over. He bled all over my leather interior, my truck. You know, he broke this it. Story, uh, Mike, Mike, this story can be documented. You can find this story if you look for it. It's out there. It's there. Documented. So, so Keith, Keith, what what happened down there to him? <laughs> he broke it. He broke it. Oh, he my broke it. God. 
Mikey, you can find that's what it. I said. It's a true story. When my peripheral, when my peripheral picked it up, Mikey, that's the first thing. Oh my God. I just, you know, kind of collapsed. Oh, yeah, away, yeah. This, you 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 get that sensation. Like when we see a guy get hit down there, we feel, you know, it was the same thing. I felt that. You know what I mean? And, and it was just game over after that. But uh the truth. And this Sorry is for- this is in the back of a club where other people are around? No, 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 no. At his house. At his house. At his house in his, in his game room. Yep. Well, I don't know if my next question is going to beat that story, but, <laughs> you know, uh, back to basketball. I, I let JB ask those tough ones. But uh, back to basketball, the, the best Drew League um, performance you've ever seen. The best Drew League performance I've ever seen. Casper Ware locking down my teammate at the time, James Hart, and giving him dropping uh, 55 points on him. Wow. Yeah. Dominated him offensively, dominated him defensively. Casper's 5'8, 5'9, maybe. You know, little stocky, strong, you know, smart basketball player. He's a dog on the court. Yes, dog James Hart that day. This isn't a question, but I'll just say this. Keith, every level you've played on, you led the league in blocks. A lot of people don't know this. Um, when you left the league, you got blackballed. A lot of people don't know this. And um, you didn't play. And you returned to play in the, uh, the G League, which is the D League at the time, but the G League. Uh, after missing so much time in basketball, you came back and you led the league in block shots with close to three a night. Why do you feel that you weren't called up? And that's how we'll wrap this up. Because I want to know that question. Um, you know, well, for one, the gang ties. And I was newly sober. They didn't think that I would be able to maintain my, my sobriety. And uh, three, the Clippers, someone in the Clippers organization had spread a rumor that I was, uh, that I was smoking crack. Oh, Mikey, my last NBA game, I weighed 220 pounds. You know, today, 21 years later, I weighed 220 pounds. That was my metabolism that didn't allow me to gain weight. My father's wiry. I have the same frame, um, you know. But I got blackballed, plain and simple, and nobody really wanted to give me an honest chance after that, especially once they say something as detrimental as he's, you know, smoking crack, you know. They gave people chances, you know, other people chances, but, uh, and I tried, that made me bitter for a time where I couldn't watch the NBA anymore because I was just pissed off seeing guys get caught with this, seeing guys get caught with that, but they were getting chance after chance after chance, whereas, you know, I didn't get any chances. And then they added some fictitious information, you know, about me that really killed me off. So, you know, I was, I was, uh, I was depressed for a long time and I turned to just a strictly liquid diet, to be honest. You know, it was just completely reckless, reckless, almost like on a suicide mission until John Lucas got in touch with me, got me down to Houston, started training me, helped me get my mind right, which led to me uh, getting into the rooms of recovery, which led to this mind altering and life altering experience and this altruistic path that I've been living ever since. So September 17th of 2007, that's my sobriety date, you know, and uh, I do live every day to help somebody, you know, with me coaching these kids and having my program, the Claw Stars Elite. My goal is to not only help players get scholarships, but help them become the best young people that they can be because they're our future leaders. There's so many distractions out there in these communities, and I don't want these kids going down the same paths that I went down. So I don't just teach basketball. I teach life experience as well, you know, and uh, it's just about spreading love and smiles, man, and, and enjoying this gift called life, Every, you know, and so I make the best of it. I enjoy the hell out of it. And I, try to, I, I try to spread that same love and joy or, you know, everywhere I go, man, if there's an opportunity for me to step in and help somebody who's troubled going through something, then that's exactly what I do without giving it a second thought. 
Well, Keith, God bless you, myself and Jermaine. I mean, you know, it was a, for me, it's a pleasure meeting you and congratulations on all the success. And thank you for sharing your amazing journey here on The Truth with us. Hey, humble you, thanks brother. for having me. Humble thanks for having me, guys. No Maybe problem. You still ain't <laughs> <laughs> don't edit that. Mikey, don't I, edit that. I part. won't edit that one out, but to finish, <laughs> I just need to say the views and opinions expressed on this podcast are those of myself, Jermaine's, and Keith. Of course, he had some crazy stories and opinions today. But stay tuned for more episodes coming soon, including part two of episode four with Jermaine's buddy and former NBA player Dante Green. Check us out on YouTube, Apple Music, Spotify, ESPNCLT.com, and of course, follow us on social media, The Truth Podcast on Facebook, and at Truth Podcast ESPN on Instagram. Keith, finally finishing off. Thanks a lot. Thanks for coming on. Thank you, fellas. You can't handle the truth.